You're listening to The Business Communicators, presented by IABC Houston. And now your hosts, Austin Stenton, Hattie Horn, and Thomas Bain. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 19 of The Business Communicators, a podcast presented by IBC Houston. My name is Austin Satin, joined alongside my co-hosts this week, Hattie Horn and Thomas Bain, on this journey as we bring you the number one podcast for all business communicators in the world, and we're happy to do that. And if you're listening right now, you might be asking, Austin, is your voice a little off right now? And the answer would be yes, and there's a reason for that. So we it's, we usually record these episodes during the lunch hour on Friday, and this past Friday when we recorded the episode was Good Friday, and the company that I work for had the day off. So I set my alarm, thinking that it was just a normal work day, and uh, alarm goes off, 6.45, 7 o'clock. I realize I have another two hours before we uh, record the podcast. I fall back asleep. Seven minutes after we were to start recording, Hattie and Thomas are blowing up my phone. Where's Austin? Where's Austin? Turns out I was rushing to get the coffee and to make sure my voice didn't sound terrible. So guys, I'm here. I am here. (laughs) I was really hoping you were going to say my voice is a little off because the Baylor Bears uh, had won the Final Four game and I was screaming my head off and I made the trip to Indianapolis and was one of the lucky ones. Which, by the way, is if you ever get the opportunity to go to a Final Four game for your team, you should do it. Well, yeah. That would just be a lie if if I said that and was <laughs> trying to say that I traveled. But, uh, no, I overslept. Overslept for a podcast. I mean, Hattie, what's wrong with me? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you. We all do it. I, myself, like I said, it was Good Friday. So you were trying to have a Good Friday. <laughs> I, I feel like it was the first time that I had, I had slept in and, you know gosh months and so it, it it felt kind of nice but um i'll tell you what i've got a, a coffee mug from canada and uh we've got what 20 percent of our podcast is uh based in canada our, our listeners are based in canada so cheers Woo-hoo! thank you for keeping me fresh and hopefully my voice improves as we continue on this podcast but guys we've got a really packed episode today we're going to talk about the little Nas and Nike situation, what's going on there. We're going to talk about the PR play from Volkswagen, vaccine passport privacy. Of course, we're going to do our, our weekly wisdom. But as a quick reminder, if you want to follow our show, just search at Biz Communicators on all of the platforms. You can definitely find us there. Or if you've got comments, questions, feedback is really the best. We encourage you to leave us feedback, whether it's on iTunes, whether it's engaging with us on social media. Or you can even text podcast to 713-360-0133. And also, quick shout out again to Carol Miner, who won our contest last week. So this week in the mail, she received her prize kit, and she actually texted us back on the text line saying, the package with the cool rollerball pens and journal arrived today. I absolutely love them. The light has been a wonderful addition to my office setup. So Carol, congratulations. And if you want to win more prizes, just follow us on social media. It's, it's as easy as that. But... Any other takeaways before I, uh, you know, just try to delay a little bit so I can get my voice back? Any other any other takeaways on the past week for you two? You both got your vaccines. How did that go? Well, mine, um, for me, um, I'm going to be honest, I had a slight headache for a couple of days. Um, took a little bit of Tylenol and um, it was over with. I was trying to tell it cease and desist. <laughs> well played. <laughs> well, mine... Uh, the day of didn't really do much, but about 24 hours later, the arm started getting sore, and then you just started feeling that just that rundown weakness. I I got home and slept for like 14, 15 hours straight. Um, went to bed at five and was up at like eight or nine o'clock the next morning. I'm like, whoa, okay. And even still, felt a little groggy yesterday, but I think I'm back to normal now. So you you sound good. You sound back to normal. And I I get my vaccine uh, next Thursday. So me oversleeping. <laughs> when we were supposed to be recording this podcast, had nothing to do with the vaccine. <laughs> nothing to do with the vaccine. <laughs> but, anyways, let's go ahead and get into the meat of the show. I think I'm, I think my voice is finally, finally there. But did you guys see the story that really just went viral all over the internet with Lil Nas and these Nike? Satan shoes that he released in limited quantity. I think 666 is how many he released. Sold them for over a thousand dollars. 
have you seen the controversy behind this? I mean, it, it's just absolutely insane. I don't look at it as a controversy myself. Mischief, their name, they're appropriately named. They got into some mischief. So, they, so tell us what happened, Hattie. Tell us what happened. <laughs> well, um, Mischief went into partnership with Little Nas X, uh, rolled out a pair of shoes that have a pentagram, have the um, a Bible verse from Luke on them, and supposedly some human blood in the bottom half of the shoes mixed with red whatever as part of a, I'd just like to say, a, a promo for Little Nas's new video um, that came out, and um, you know, Montero is the name of the video, which up to this point has over almost six million views oh, not, in, no. in that one day. It's currently, just a week after release, seventy million views on YouTube. That that is amazing, and the and the. Uh, the sneakers, 666 pairs, are part of the 666 so-called Satan number and selling for over $1,000, which personally myself I would not buy because I think they're ugly. I did watch the video, which I think is a visual, for lack of better words, feast in terms of Little Nas practically gives the devil a lap dance in it. And he's just colorfully made up. And it looks like, it, to me, it seems like it just kind of aligns with his whole personality and his uh, opportunity as he came out. He's really coming out in this. So if you have, um, it's very interesting. But I also saw recently where uh, Mischief was, uh, they were, they have a cease and desist. The mm -hmm. judges rule that yeah. they can stop fulfilling the orders because that it's a trademark infringement on Nike, which... It's typical of Nike, you, you uh, use their logo, they're gonna do a cease and desist. It's regular, it's nothing new. So uh, for people who think they're talking about canceling, Nike needs to stop. That's because they don't understand brand. They don't know anything about the shoe game. And three, I think that the biggest the biggest deal or success for anybody was Lil Nas and Miss Chip. Oh, they got away with it. They got away with this for a minute. Absolutely. You look at you look at Lil Nas and he I think he's really the first artist that has come from the internet YouTube culture. You know, his his song Old Town Road, he started it started going viral on Reddit and you know, YouTube. And he really understands how to make a name for himself. Like he he understands the algorithms and, and how the internet works. And Gabriel Whaley, who is the uh, CEO at Mischief, he's a former BuzzFeed guy. He understands how internet culture works. And so whether or not you like the shoes or not, this is a brilliant marketing play from Lil Nas and Gabriel Whaley, you know, because at the end of the day, people have been talking about this shoe and this song for over a week. You can't buy that kind of publicity. Uh, they had to manufacture it, and and it's worked because now they're getting like all these politicians to retweet it, trying to say you shouldn't buy these shoes, you shouldn't do this. But he, they got ministers in in exactly, the middle of it as well, exactly. saying saying all this you know negative stuff about them too. Exactly. So you're right. They won. They, they won. They won. The and his ultimate goal was to drive people to his song Montero, "Call Me by Your Name," and if you listen to the lyrics you know it's he wants it to be sort of an anthem for the you know the lgbtq plus community and that's what he's really passionate about and so he's driven just on youtube 70 million people to watch the video number one on spotify number one on all the charts number one on all the trending charts he knew exactly what he was doing and even he's a prime example exactly and, of how to use the internet exactly and he knew that even if nike did sue him it was what half a million dollars, maybe a million dollars that he was out. He got that what 10, 20, 30 fold and free marketing and publicity. But Thomas, you're the marketing guy. It's Lil Nas a genius. Absolutely. Absolutely. His his crossover with Old Town Road, um, and then this shoe is just showing his his marketing savvy all the way through. I sit there and think is that if Nike, if he would have partnered with, you know, the safe route or what Nike's already one of their stable of spokespeople, 
if Nike would have had the same reaction. Not, not calling it the Satan shoe, but something else. Or they would have been like, hey, good job. Thanks for promoting us. Because I've seen it time and time again about, and especially in today's world with internet advertising, is we want our ads out there, but we got to be real careful on which sites it goes on to. You know, I've seen seen places, we, we're talking um, the, the, the devil shoe, the 666 shoe, but it's it goes further than that is I've seen pe- seen brands who didn't want to advertise on the, the Fox show Lucifer because it wasn't fitting their corporate brand. Um, and, and he only released 666 shoes, well, 665 because the other one was supposed to go out, but it's not going out now. He could have done 10,000 of them and they would have sold out in a week, even at $1,000. It would have sold out before the restraining order would have come out, period. And, and so, so, Hattie, I agree. Nike had to put out the cease and desist order. They didn't follow their culture guides. If they don't do it, then you're opening yourself up to a whole slew of copycats and everything in between. At the end of the day, it's a win-win. The, the, the restraining order does nothing. 665 shoes have already been shipped. Yeah. You can't turn around and say, United States Postal Service, hey, we need you to return those. All they can do is turn around and ask the people who bought them, hey, would you mind selling us back your shoe? And and anybody who's got half a brain is going to be like, no. Or they're going to be like, yeah, I'll sell you back my shoe for $3 million or some astronomical number and say, okay, Nike, your play. The ball's in your court now. Yeah, it's it's just fascinating. And really quickly, I think we mentioned this on the on the podcast last week, but Nike in twenty twenty spent three point six billion dollars on marketing and advertising in twenty twenty. I mean, that's that's an incredible number. Um, so you know, if, if they they are really protective of their brand, and they should be protective of their brand. Um, and they've they've had like you know questionable collaborations before that have drawn controversy um, or outcry, if you will. Um, but a lot of people that don't know anything about the shoe game, like Hattie alluded to a little bit earlier, when, you know, I I look at the Baylor message board, for example, and uh, the Baylor message board is really hyped right now about the basketball team, but there was a thread on there that Baylor University needs to cancel its partnership with Nike. And I click on it, I'm like, what are these people talking about? Like, I was like, is there something I missed? And somebody says, they, Nike just released this little Nas shoe. As a Christian university, we can't stand by this. And then they were getting so violent. And then uh, there were some people in the threads who were like sneakerheads. And they're like, okay, Boomer, you don't know anything about the shoe game. <laughs> like, here's what's happening. This is not Nike. And the guy was insistent, like, yes, these are Nike shoes. And it's like, yes, they're Nike Air Maxes, but they were customized. Like, the customized sneaker market is so big. And you even see it in sports, too. The customized NBA shoes, the customized baseball cleats, customized football cleats. It's a huge industry. And Nike generally doesn't do much to stop it. They understand that shoe customization is part of the sneaker industry. But they knew that they had to step up because there were a lot of people that were angry thinking this was a Nike-produced shoe. And they had to just say, hey, look, it's not. So at the end of the game, at the end of the day, similar to what Thomas said, Nike got what they wanted. You know, they got they got their name taken away. And so it wasn't a Nike product. Lil Nas got what he wanted. I mean, just it's fascinating. It's interesting you say about the customization. Um, you, 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 We talked sports. We talked Nike being sponsors, possible things and pictures of all the different sports, things like that. The sports companies and the apparel companies have been playing the customization game for years. There's a reason a new jersey for every major team is released every year. is because people go out because they need the newest jersey with the Nike logo or the Adidas logo or the Puma logo or insert company name here to, to add to the repertoire. And so, so the customization of just sneakers... It's been going on for years. It's the whole jerseys. It's why they do the sponsorships. They get they get money on the sales of the jerseys as well. Well, you know, let's be real too. If the company also didn't have control of that particular partnership, it, they're obligated to to tell you, no, you can't use this because um, while it's just wonderful publicity for them at the uh, at, at some point. They also didn't have control of that. When you say um, Nike has a partnership, they've done some controversial partnerships with people. Yeah, but they had control exactly. over those. Exactly. They didn't have control over Mischief and Little Nas X's partnership. So, yeah. And when and when you're spending $3.6 billion <laughs> a year on advertising and marketing, you want to have full control. You damn straight. Yeah, 100%. So, I'm curious. 
What is the final takeaway from you guys on this Lil Nas and Nike situation? Hattie, I'm going to start with you from, you know, a communications perspective. What's your final takeaway and what can communicators kind of, if, there, if there's like a lesson learned? If there's any lesson learned in all of this, from a communicator standpoint, uh, from my perspective, it's you have to control the message. Um, and if you can't control the message, you're going to have to figure out a different strategy and approach for somebody takes away um, uh, your brand or, or thinks they're going to capitalize on your brand for a minute. You're going to have to take the steps in the right way. And be consistent about it, just like Nike's been consistent. They were consistent in terms of, you know what, uh, they've done this. We're going to send our consistent message out about cease and desist. And if you're little Nas and if you're mischief, it turns out, oh, well, we're going to take advantage of this brand for the minute that we can. Um, but once they have communicated that we need to stop, we're going to follow that policy and those guidelines because we can't afford not right. to. Thomas, what's your final takeaway from a marketing perspective? What can marketers and communications professionals take from this situation? Nike's got to protect that $500 logo or $600 logo. I don't remember how, the exact amount that they spent on that logo um, 10 years ago. Um, reality is, is how do you hit the na nail on the head is as business communicators, look for those things to push the envelopes. Uh, look for the advertising opportunities to push the envelopes, but then follow the law. If you get the cease and desist order, follow it. Don't try to break it. Um, but then also on Nike side of it, follow follow your playbook. I, I'm actually applauding both sides of it. I, I think that both of them are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing by ma protecting their brand and gaining publicity on both sides of the ball. Absolutely. So well done, Nike. Well done, Lil Nas. Well done, Mischief. You've got the Business Communicators podcast talking about it. Um, just like everyone else is talking about it this week. So well done on this Beautiful case study of viral marketing, if you will. Um, so kudos to that. Uh, it was just brilliant and, and good for you know Nike for also you know I, I don't know this this thing is going to be just interesting to watch. I can't wait to see what what comes next from Lil Nas from his you know marketing ideas and what mischief continues to do. But last week was April Fools, and uh, I like to refer to it as Aggie Day. Sorry to our Texas A and M listeners. <laughs> Don't apologize if you're going to put it out there. Sorry. Uh-uh. Own it. Uh -uh. Own it. Own it. Be accountable. Fair. Fair. But last week was Aggie Day or April Fool's Day. And I always hate it when brands try to make a joke. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes they can be creative. You know, like you might have football team or a baseball team say here's our new jersey that we're debuting this year and you're kind of like i actually might like this it's different but i like it and then they at the end of the day they're like april fools but you can buy our new jersey here you know something like that but sometimes brands go a little bit too far and they think something is going to be funny or different and they think it's going to go over well and then it just completely backs backfires and i think that's where we come to VW this week, Volkswagen of America. They flat out lied about rebranding. They they had a press release, I guess, that got leaked a few days before April Fool's. And it said that they were going to change their name in the U.S. to Volkswagen. So V-O-L-T-S instead of Volkswagen. And they were doing this to try to, I guess, compete with Tesla and the EV market, which is something that, you know... VW is really trying to push, especially here in the United States. But a lot of people kind of questioned is, you know, is this the right move? Is is VW just doing this as a publicity stunt? And they, they declined, you know, to even answer. And then ultimately they had to come out and say, yeah, it was a stunt. It went over poorly. And uh, Volkswagen actually issued a tweet saying, we know 66 is an unusual age to change your name, but we've always been young at heart. Introducing Volkswagen, similar to Volkswagen, but with a renewed focus on electric driving, starting with our all new, all electric SUV, the ID4, available today. So they did this to try to promote a car. And it just backfired heavily. Like every brand, every everyone on social media was talking about it. And uh, yeah. I don't know. They confirmed that this was a lie in the service of a marketing stunt, and it ticked a lot of people off. I mean, is this just trying to be cute, or is it 
<laughs> trying to misinform people. I don't know. What, what, what's your take, Hattie? Point blank, it was a prank fail. April Fool failed. Yeah. And they're not the only ones that have done this kind of thing. Um, you think about Google. Remember the mic drop when they did it with the Despicable Me a uh, minion that was dropping a microphone and it just kind of immediately archived the yeah. message back in the day. You had the Taco Liberty Bell. You've had companies and brands who tried this so-called April Fool joke and it's messed up mm-hmm. and, and it just failed. Uh, Volkswagen, I add them to the list. And But I also agree with you. I don't like it when brands try to pull a joke and it, it's just not good. And when it fails, then they come back and try to clean up the mess and it makes it even worse. And to me, I think it made Volkswagen's uh, prank worse than what it already was. Well, the worst part is, is they had like this mock press release that they were going to issue on April 1st. But their PR person leaked it anyway. They leaked it early. And then the very next day, the very next day, (laughs) before April 1st even happens, Volkswagen is like... Guys, we just got to run with it. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, let, 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 let's just go with it. If it falls down, it just falls down worse than already what it is. And it did. Yeah. Flat on the face. Flat on his face. Uh, there was actually a tweet that I saw from uh, a guy named uh, Nathan Bomi. He's a USA Today business reporter. And he said, Dear Volkswagen, you lied to me. You lied to the Associated Press, CNBC, Reuters, and various trade publications. This was not a joke. It was deception. In case you hadn't noticed, we have a misinformation problem in this country. Now you're a part of it. Why should anyone trust you again? I mean, I think that's probably that's a strong take. Uh, but I think a lot of people have that sentiment, especially because of the diesel issue that VW had several years ago mm-hmm. and having to pay a multi-billion dollar fine. I think outside of BP, the BP oil spill fine, Volkswagen's fine was the most expensive of all time. Ironically, BP and VW actually partnered for something um, <laughs> a, a few weeks back, which I do think is kind of ironic. But Thomas, what's your take? I, I come from the come from the school of thought that we have to have some fun and fun in the place. And April Fool's has always been a good day for it. Coming early, not not so good. But but you have like the GMs who rebrand their logo to make it look more electrified and everything like that. So so it makes it start to look like it's a real, real live. This is what we're gonna do. It wasn't. Um, I think that that press release was extremely hard, hard, uh, harshly w- worded. But at this, but at the end of the day, the fake news is really there. And if it's coming out as a press release and you're launching a big old campaign for it, then does it feel like you're trying to do ha-ha funny April Fool's versus this is really what we're going to go for. So, you know, I am I come from the school of thought that, you know, shame on VW and then, you know, also have a little fun yesterday as, as my statement on April 1st. What, what other brands have you seen that have either done April 1st well or have performed so badly? I'm just looking at this list real quick on, on Brand Launch and Brand Launch has like a top five best and worst. And uh, I'm, I'm seeing this tweet from 2016. It's from a company called Deliveroo. And uh, they launched a product on April 1st, 2016, that said it was going to be a teleorder. It says, order food with the power of your mind. And that kind of terrifies me a little bit because I'm convinced sometimes that my cell phone is listening to me. Uh, you know, I was actually at uh, El Tiempo, which is a, a, a Tex-Mex restaurant here in, in Houston. Um, the other night with a few friends, we were sitting outside and I think I was, you know, discussing, you know, one of my first dates with with Katie. And uh, before I even, you know, mentioned where we had gone that night, one of my friends kind of jokes in, did you go to Dave and Buster's? Because that would have been awesome if you went to Dave and Buster's. And I said, ah, no, I said, you know, it's actually been several years that I've been to Dave and Buster's. But anyways, I get back home, pull up Instagram, and there's a targeted ad. For Dave and Buster's, <laughs> I was like, you know, my cell phone was definitely listening on that case. So this, this, this whole order food with the power of your mind, we might not be that far off from that actually being reality. But Thomas, Hattie, are there any other like brands where you've kind of said, all right, this is good, or maybe this is not good? For myself, I I haven't seen any that have really been good to me. I don't know why they even keep doing it. Um. I read one here where it talks about how Taco Bell 
they actually said that they bought the Liberty Bell and they put in the Philadelphia Inquirer. They and several other major, they contain these full page ads on April 1st, 1996. Headline, Taco Bell buys the Liberty Bell. And they had calls all into the newsletter, news, newspaper, excuse me. And it said the humor set in and then Taco Bell, it failed. Um, and Taco Bell had to donate $50,000 for preservation and upkeep of the national treasure at the end of the day when it didn't fly right with everybody. So to me, that just, I just tell people, I just say, you know, that's not going to work. You just stop. Who comes up with this stuff? Yeah. I, I think the real, the real benefit of an April Fool's joke, a good one, is one that lives for There's about a benefit. two days. Get you talking about it three days, and then it's forgettable. It's not one of those things that you think of years and years and years down the road. Um, I think the CDC released one a couple years back about what happens if the zombie apocalypse happens. Um, and it's funny because they've had to wash that one off and uh, use it now uh, for the COVID about how to do socially distancing and things like that. And I think that started from an April Fool's. I don't know. Don't quote me on that one. I'm probably way off. But but looking through the list, like I did the same thing that Austin did and you did, Hattie, about looking through them. And I was like, oh, I do remember that one. Oh, I do remember that one. But I never really thought about them after the fact. And so and so that's why I think that, you know, some of them were good. Burger King with a left-handed Whopper. This Whopper is only to be eaten with your left hand. And then the, the Liberty Bell. I was like, oh, I do remember that one, too. But see, but see I think I, I this kind of re- there was an article that I was reading from Anne Gen. She she's she writes at Content Marketing Institute, and I, I thought she had some really good points. And, and she wrote a story with a headline that says, "It's April Fool's Day worth the risk for brands." And I think you know a Burger King or a Taco Bell, they're already out there. You know, they're already kind of making these memorable moments. You know, kind of with with their brands. You know, they're kind of pushy. You look at like Wendy's, for example. They've really got that you know Twitter account, which is. Uh, it's feisty, if you will. You know, so a company like that, I, I guess that it makes sense. But she provides some some tips um, on before you hit publish, is this a good idea? And she says that if your brand has never used humor or the element of surprise in its content, don't do it. If your brand thinks of April Fool's as a one-day joke, don't do it. If your brand isn't prepared to devote significant resources to develop a thoughtful, well-executed campaign, don't do it. If your brand leaders can't weather criticism, don't do it. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, and then she she discusses how you can, if, if you are this type of company that can do these things, that you should integrate it into your brand. She actually uses Burger King, Thomas, like you said, as an example about, you know, a Whopper toothpaste ad that they ran in the UK as something that could be good. And she says, you know, if, if, if Huber is good one day a year, it should be part of your brand voice throughout the year. And I thought that was a really interesting takeaway. I, I'm going to echo that. I'm going to 100% echo that because having healthcare background in, in my repertoire, we always battled every year with Halloween about should people be allowed to wear costumes on Halloween while working in the hospital? And and at first it was, yeah, sure, why not? But then over the years it got to the point to where, no, you really shouldn't because nothing looks worse than having to, to do life-saving measures dressed as a clown. Or having to deliver bad news to a family dressed as a Scooby-Doo character. As you have to really understand who your company is and what they're trying to do. And how do you do it. So so, so I echo exactly what she wrote. Um, and and so, sorry to, to say bad on the healthcare system. But I'm, I'm going to echo that. Don't let your people dress up for Halloween. I'm sorry to say that. My take on it is if your base doesn't expects you to be silly or expects you to do things like that, then they're definitely going to expect you to do something on Halloween and April Fool's. But if it's something that they're not used to seeing from you and then you just kind of spring it on them because you think, oh, this is unique and this is different and this should be fun for our base and that's not them, it's going to backfire on you. I, I completely agree with what the writer was saying. My favorite annual April Fool's joke is, you know, I mentioned that April 1st is Aggie Day, and there is a ESPN puts out a fake top 25 college football poll, and they always put Texas A&M ranked number one, and Aggie fans every single year without fail 
think that Texas A&M is projected to be the number one team in the country <laughs> the following year. And then you actually like sit it around. Like my buddy sent this around to his, uh, to his A&M friends yesterday. And he sent me like the screen, t- like screen caps of the text messages. They were like, Oh yeah, that's not surprising. You know, we've got a lot of talent coming back. And then you look at the list and you have like Alabama ranked in the twenties. Like you know for a fact Alabama football is not gonna be preseason like number twenty. It doesn't matter who they have, as long as Nick Saban's there, they're gonna be a top five team. You're not gonna have like uh you know, some small school that nobody's ever heard of in the top ten. Like that's not gonna be the case. But it, it was just so funny to see Aggie fans year in and year out say, This is legit, guys, we're gonna we're gonna do it. It's our year finally. <laughs> That's why they, and you know why they call it April Fools is because it is an Aggie joke. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> <Aggie's> sad, absolutely. <laughs> and people still want to go to that school. <laughs> why? I got nothing. I'm not saying anything. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plead the fifth on this one. So, well, I'm not because my school <laughs> is in the system with them, and people want to call us Texas A&M and M at Purdy. I said I don't think so. We don't want a no. I don't think so. We probably just lost all of our Texas A&M listeners, but uh, eh. you, you can commiserate with me. I will. I promise you, I won't make too much fun of y'all. I mean, uh, yes, too I'm, much. Yeah, Dare us to say say that about A&M? Well, I'm a, I'm gonna be real. I'm not gonna joke. I make fun of everybody's school. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I just make I just make fun of them more. That's true. That, Hattie that's is an true. equal opportunity. I'm an equal opportunity <laughs> hater. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Got a good engineering department. <laughs> Who? All of Who? them. A M. Uh uh-uh, uh, Prairie View A M. They have a good engineering department too. Not two only. Also, so you're saying you're the only university that has an engineering department that's good? We're the we're the only one with the best one. Oh okay. I like it. I like it. I'm lo- I'm loyal. I like I like the loyalty. I like the loyalty. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. But. <laughs> You guys mentioned that you had the vaccine, the, your your second dose of Pfizer, uh, the, this past week, and I, you know I get my Moderna second vaccine in just a few days. We've been actually discussing this on our group thread about vaccine passports, you know, because that's something that is probably coming uh, for a lot of people who want to travel uh, at some point in twenty twenty one. There are a few countries that, uh, like Iceland, for example, uh, that has said that if you are an American and you are fully vaccinated, you can come to our country. Greece has said the same thing. And instead of carrying that little card from the CDC that proves that you got the the Pfizer, the Moderna, or the J&J vaccine, it looks like vaccine passports might be an option. And uh, there's been a lot of concerns on whether this violates people's privacy, if governments and businesses can ask to see, you know, whether or not you're vaccinated. Curious what y'all's take is in this situation. And and Thomas, I'm gonna start with you because you mentioned that you've got the healthcare background. What's your take? You know, I'm kind of, I think they have to be very careful how how they word this and go from it. Because, you know, you hear the scarlet letter, oh, if you don't have that, the card, you can't travel. But then also, depending on how how it's gone through, is it going to be part of the visa application to go into a different country? But but then, is it, are you going to need the passport to go to a different city or to travel across the state lines inside the country? There, there's way too many unknowns about the whole thing. Um, but before we really, truly dive into that, I want to talk about the Johnson & Johnson real quickly because they had the big big challenge with what happened in Baltimore, and now there's the big push about governors trying to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um it's it, it, get vaccinated. Don't worry about which one it has. That's, that's all I'm going to say from there. Yeah, the but the, ba- the best shot is the one in your arm. Yes, but 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 to the passport thing, I think I think really it comes down to how are they going to force it? Are you going to have to carry the card and then show it? Then what happens if you lose the card? Because then that starts playing with the HIPAA HIPAA violation. If somebody finds it and says, "Mr. Thomas Bain, your vaccine card is available here. Your Johnson and Johnson vaccine card is here." Um, where, how where, is that how a HIPAA you... violation? Isn't a HIPAA violation like if, if I lose if I lose the, the vaccine card at like H E B here in Texas and somebody like calls me or m- mentions something over the phone, that's 
that's not a HIPAA violation. I mean, but but if it's if it's you and them, but if they're announcing it over the store that you, but HIPAA but is, it, but HIPAA only applies to medical professionals talking about your medical records. So how is that? There a HIPAA, you go. How is that a HIPAA violation? It's not. The wording is very, very, very vague, meaning that insurance companies and anybody that has any, but sort a store of manager say, at an H E B, telling you, and then too, and, 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 and they do the black teams there. So, but the store manager doesn't do it. But but that's yeah. where it comes into play. Is if they announce that hey you lost something, come pick it up. But now if they say Austin Smith with or Austin Staten with your uh, with your um, Johnson and Johnson vaccine card or anything like that. So 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 by that note, even at the pharmacies, even at the pharmacies, when you're sitting there, the names that if you look at it is only your first initials. It's not even your first name. But Thomas, there is no one that's going to announce it that way. That is not. That's not even logical. Uh, but you were talking about the passports, and I, I kind of wanted to put my little two cents in there. What's interesting for me for a passport for this is that it'll be the first of its kind for this type of vaccine versus we've been getting vaccines for years. The other part is for me, how long will this passport um, be valid? Because we don't know how long even the vaccine is valid. Um going into any country it's just proven that you've been vaccinated and you're not going to bring this deadly whatever into their country so i'm kind of um i like the idea of proving that i have been vaccinated but as for a passport itself and when you think about regular passports they last 10 years so the time frame for all of this they haven't that that doesn't seem to be thought through so i think they're probably trying to make this a mobile play and not something that you have to go to like the passport office to actually get done. Um, it's something where you can probably like scan in your vaccine card and it'll that, update. That's all good. That's all good and fine. Yeah. I think that's fine. I have, you, I could get mine laminated now cause I'm done with that. Yeah. So it's a matter of just showing that I've had this done mm -hmm. and I can come into your country, but I don't, the idea of a passport and the meaning of it. Yeah means something else to me it's like can you get the stamp on the on the vaccine passport i don't know <laughs> but... that, so 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 you know what i'm saying yeah. it's the it's the language that we're using and that's what i'm questioning as well as the timing and i don't want somebody telling me they're probably doing this because that that's not clear to me and i'm a type of person that says you know can you help me understand what you mean by this right but the other challenge is, is with these pass with these cards how easy is it to, to make one fraudulent and to bring it in, it's show, show your card. It's a piece of paper with some pen on it at the end of the day. That, that Everything is fraudulent up to this part, Thomas. I, I don't disagree, but they've taken steps for our, our physical passports to be less fraudulent with embedded RFID chips and all, and uh, holograms and everything else in between. I hear you. But, but, well, th and that's why they shouldn't call it a passport. And, then. and that's what they've been saying, too, is because all of these people are posting their vaccine cards on the Internet. You know, posting it on Twitter, posting it on Facebook, posting it on Instagram. And they've actually, healthcare professionals have actually had to come out and say, don't do this. Don't. There's articles out there that tell you yeah. don't do it. And so that's why I've been you've been them. seeing like people that are smart cover up the numbers. Because that that's the record. That's the proof that you are who you say you are and that you've gotten the vaccine, the jab in the arm. Um, so yeah, it's... It can very easily be, be manipulated. And, and at the end of the day, like, if, if you download, like, the Clear app, you know, think of it as, like, think of this as, like, TSA security, right? Clear app allows you to skip the line because you're a known person and you've got, like, a five-year window before you have to get it renewed. Um, if, if the Clear app is, is actually launching their own version of the, uh, the vaccine passport, but if you've got someone else's information, is the app going to know that... <laughs> I mean, I don't think so. So many questions. Yeah. So many questions and not a lot of answers. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll say my one takeaway for this is I like the fact that countries are starting to say if you're vaccinated, you can come. And that just makes me happy as someone who likes to travel. And Amen. Amen. I'm so excited about that. So, Hattie, if I see any good flight deals, I actually saw one yesterday. Houston to Greece in October. Under well, $500. Y'all know. But you know, I got my little side hustle now. Oh, tell us about it. Ooh, what's your side hustle it? here? My little side hustle now, y'all. I'm an independent travel agent. Nice. So love it. if you're, because I love to travel too. And so because I love to travel, I would love to help other people 
fulfill their travel dreams. So, and and you actually have a good post about this on your website, your personal website, uh, which is mythirdact.com. Um, check it out. My third at blog. Blog. Com. Dot com. Check it. Check it out. Um, I think we retweeted it or I retweeted it like a few weeks ago, but Hattie shared it on her Twitter page as well. Um, she's got some good insights on there, so give her a follow. And uh, if you want to talk travel with us. We all love talking travel, so just hit us up. Yes, we do. Hit us up on social media, but uh, yeah, I can't wait. We'll see. This is going to be interesting to follow. Um, you know, when I had to go to Brazil in 2016 for for work, I had uh, you know to get a bunch of shots. When I went off to college, you had to get get a bunch of shots, and you had to prove that you have these shots. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I don't think this is anything new. I think the idea mm-hmm. of a passport is new. Um, and so, and of course, you've got politicians that are going to be outraged. Regardless of what you do, if you tell them water is wet, you're gonna have half the half the country <laughs> say no, it's not. Half the country say yes, it is. So uh, it'll it'll be interesting to see how this kind of matures over the next few months. I think really my challenge with it is is the passport is being something physical. If it goes to like the EMR, the electronic medical record, to where it's hey, here's this, but then you th- throw in a whole nother level of pi- of uh, privacy of biometrics and facial recognition, and how do you know that this jump drive is really yours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my challenge with it right now is just the physical card is, is having to show your physical card. They can make it some way that it's not. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we all have the 5g chip in our arm. And so they should know that we're vaccinated, right? <laughs> the, the first one injects it and the second one turns it on. Is that what it boils down to? Yeah. It? I've gotten, I, I heard that you have that both you and you and Hattie have had great cell service. Uh, over the past <laughs> few days. So. <laughs> That, that is unequivocally false because one of my side hustles, I was actually in a uh, pharmacy in the middle of nowhere two days ago, and my cell signal was non-existent. Like, I think it was <laughs> negative cell signal, in all honesty. Oh, too fun. Too fun. We're just joking. There is no 5G ship or Microsoft ship in your arm. Don't believe that. If anyone tells you that, they are crazy. Don't listen to them. That is our final <laughs> takeaway when it comes to the vaccine passport. But we do like to have a little bit of fun here and uh, poke fun at one another. So... That's enough on the vaccine talks. Let's go to our final segment of the week, and that is our Wednesday wisdom or writing prompts or whatever you want to call it. And and last week, you might recall that we had uh, a writing prompt that was, why do people put things off? And I thought it was a great question. We posted it on our LinkedIn page, and we actually got some you know pretty solid uh, feedback from uh, two people. So one is Justin Cade. He said that a friend of mine told me a story about a comedian he went to see. That in the opening, thank the audience for attending. In his words, it's, quote, it's really, really easy to do nothing, and you all decide to come out and see me. I think it's as simple as that. It's easier to do nothing than something. Great words. And we say the same thing with the podcast. You know, you could spend an hour listening to any other show a week, uh, and you choose to listen to our podcast. So we definitely thank you for that. Um, And hopefully you don't put off listening to our podcast. That would be the ideal scenario. And R.B. McKeon, who is based in Washington State, said that random things where the theme is, I prefer to assume all is well rather than do the right thing and find out that it isn't. Examples include getting blood work and checking my credit score. And then she noted, (laughs) both are fine, by the way. And I just thought that was brilliant. And uh, I actually commented below her post and I said, this was and still is my strategy with my college grade point average. I still don't know what it is. I just refuse to look. I just know I graduated. (laughs) I know it was above a 2.0 and below a 4.0. That's all I know. So (laughs) those are my takeaways. And we appreciate both Justin and RB for giving us feedback. But any any comments on uh, Justin or RB's thoughts, Thomas and Hattie? Shout out to RB. Preach it, truth. I, I agree. You know, nothing's wrong if you don't go to the, it, you know, put the little tape over your car mechanic thing or don't go to the doctor because don't do that, please, um, because you feel fine. Um, so, yes, those are both true. And yeah. Austin, I love your comment about your GPA. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. I learned other things in college. But, of course, we've got our book, 400 Writing Prompts. Uh, just to save time, I'm going to I'm gonna flip to a random page myself, and I'm going to point. Ooh. This is interesting. If you could sit down with any outlaw or criminal, past or present, who would it be, why, and what would you ask them? Mine is Lizzie Borden. Who is that? Tell us. Lizzie Borden had an axe, gave her father 40 wax. 
when she saw what she had done, gave her mother 41. Y'all never heard of Lizzie Borden? No, but I love the song. <laughs> Lizzie, um, I don't know if you ever see, y'all have got to see the movie. Um, it's a very interesting young lady who was living with her parents and she was accused of killing both of her parents with an ax. And I guess my question would have been to her, did you, you, did you hate him that much that you had to kill the, so many blows? That, that, that's just a crime of passion. Wonder, why did you do it, girly? Why did you do it? Interesting. I like it. I like, I, I, I like it. it. It's something that I hadn't heard and hadn't heard the song before either. But Thomas, who was someone that you would want to sit down with and ask him a question and ask him why they did it? This one threw me for a complete loop. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it threw me too. I did not expect that from this book, but I literally, that's the randomness that happened to me after I'm writing this. What's, what's popping in my head, th- there's three of them, really, and, and two of them are kind of similar, is because one of them I watched on Netflix, the, 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 the bomber, the Richard Jewell story, he's not the bomber, um, from the United States, the Olympics uh, back in Atlanta. And it talked about the guy who uh, who was the bomber, and, and all of his trying to do the, the hatred for it, and how he was trying to get the the known of the Unabomber, but but and Ted Kaczynski. But at the end of the day, I would want to talk to those two about why were you just trying to see how long you could get away with it or anything like that? Because these are two two highly functioning smart people. But the other one that co- the other t- pair that comes to my mind is Bonnie and Clyde, and and and, and the Highwaymen on there. Is because they were so loved by the American people, but so hated by the the, the law enforcement. Hated hated rightfully so by the law enforcement because they were cop killers. But but just how they were able to manage their personal brand amongst the masses because the masses helped hide them throughout the rest the, the bank robbers throughout everybody. So 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 those are two things that I'm I, I would want to just talk about was you know. What position to go down this path of crime and how did you manage to get society behind you? And then how did you manage to stay hidden for all those years? Those would be my my two or three, really. That's where my head went. There's about four others that I also want to talk about, but that's another topic. You mentioned Bonnie and Clyde. They were captured near Grand Prairie, Texas, so near the uh, the Dallas area. So I think, I, was it Dallas or was it Louisiana? Uh, that's remember. where they lived was in the Dallas area is where they were from originally, but they were actually uh, hunted was, down in uh, Louisiana. Was it was it near Ruston, Ruston and Grambling? Was it near that area? I could be wrong. I don't know. It's I don't know my my criminal history, but I I would probably the person that I would probably want to sit down with and have a conversation is Pablo Escobar. Uh He's an interesting, interesting character. And if you're not familiar with him, I don't know where you've been, but he was a drug kingpin, you know, 1980s, early 1990s, known as the king of cocaine. Uh, His net worth was estimated to be somewhere between, you know, 30 to 50 billion dollars. He was one of the, the richest people in the world, but it was all, you know hidden money, you know, through shell companies, through, uh, he would literally bury million dollars of cash and hide it. Uh, he put a lot of fear into, I think, uh, especially the United States with the drug industry, you know, the, 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 the spread of cocaine, but he was actually kind of beloved in his home country and his home, uh, city, which is uh, Medellin, Colombia, because of all the the good that he did for, you know, the the poor and you know the the favelas essentially. And so I I think that would be a fascinating conversation to have with him. Is how did you go from, you know, growing up in the poorest of poor neighborhoods, to doing what you do now, and and why do you choose to give back to that neighborhood? Um, so I, th- I think that would be kind of an interesting conversation to have. Um, I don't know. It, really fascinating. There are, there are other people I could have chosen. I was trying to think of more international, who had more of an international impact. Um, and I, I, f- I feel like at least Escobar, he knew what he was doing was wrong. 100%. He knew that. Um, he murdered a lot of people. So we're not trying to say he's a good guy. Um, but you often don't see criminals give back 
like that to communities, which I think is really fascinating. So, so here's a fun fact. People in Colombia are still uh, questioning his whole thing because he imported hippos that now run wild in Colombia, and they're still trying to figure out how to capture them and figure out what to do with them <laughs> for his private zoo. Random fact there. But he also did things you know, like um, linked to the assassination of the soccer player who scored an own goal against the United States in the World Cup. Escobar versus Escobar. If you that's if you if you get the chance, watch that documentary. Uh, it's an ESPN thirty for thirty documentary. Escobar versus Escobar, or no, it's called it's called the two Escobars. Uh, and and the t- the two Escobars. I think it came out in in twenty ten, uh, but it's a really really fascinating discussion between Andres Escobar, who was arguably one of the top Colombian soccer players, uh, you know, played for the top clubs, and then Pablo Escobar, who was a huge soccer fan. And of course, in the 1994 uh, World Cup, Colombia was heavily favored against the United States. And Colombia, that team, was expected to potentially contend or win uh, the World Cup, and he scored an own goal. And Colombia ended up getting knocked out of the World Cup as a result. So if you get the chance, uh, check it out. The two Escobars, I think it's got like... 85 to 90 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So if you're looking for something to watch this week, check it out. It's 10 years old, but still an incredibly well done story. On on that note, I'm going to end, and it, it's it, it's kind of thought provoking. Um, you talked to ESPN 30 for 30, the Lance Armstrong story. It's a two part series, really good. And at the end of it, there there's a saying at the end of it is is are there good people who do bad things, or are there bad people who do good things? Because even with Lance Armstrong, who cheated his way to seven Tour de France's. He started the Lance Armstrong Foundation about communicating how to cope with cancer. What that organization has done has been phenomenal. I don't think it's called Lance Armstrong Foundation anymore, but just overall, I think I think that it's there. And so to Austin's point about Pablo so Escobar, you're te- so you're te- you're technically saying that Lance Armstrong is a good person? No, I'm not. I'm just saying that there's. I, I just wanted to clarify, though. Okay. But but but, but to Austin's point about Pablo Escobar <laughs> giving back to the poor and helping bring Medellin and, and the poor healthcare and things like that coming up. I think I think so. That, that makes so does that make Pablo Oscar Escobar a good person? No, no, it does not. What I'm saying is, I'm just is, messing is, with you, Thomas. I, I, I know you are. <laughs> but but there are a lot of things in this world that came from evil that actually do good for society and there are a lot of things that came from good people that actually were really really bad and so we talk about taking this taking the time to take a step back and to look at look at the bigger picture and and to say the book is not just the cover truly understand it and so so my closing remarks for this whole episode is this this was a perfect topic about it is is why why did you do it how were, how did you do it? Um, be be free thinkers, but don't be evil. Don't be evil. Be good. Don't create the six 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 shoe, and then tell <laughs> the six 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 shoe. I, I think that's a whole other conversation. Whole other conversation. We go on for hours. <laughs> Not at nine o'clock in the morning. We need some uh, stiff drinks over that one. Yeah, we're, it's it's ten fifteen in the morning as we are wrapping up the show. My coffee is empty, but hopefully my voice is fully back. And uh, I want to thank you both for bearing with me as I woke up incredibly late. And to our listeners, we hope that you enjoyed this episode of the podcast and of course we always do encourage that you follow us on social media just search at biz communicator on all of the uh the digital media platforms you can also uh visit our website the business we of course love having interactions on social media so thanks to justin and rb for uh contributing to our writing prompt last week really appreciate your insights and thoughts and you know if you want to share your insights and uh opinions on you know a criminal that you would like to have a, a discussion with Drop it in the comments below. We would definitely be interested to see who you would want to have a conversation with. Uh, This is a writing prompt that I didn't know existed in the book, so we're glad that we had it. But uh, we hope that you all enjoyed this episode this week. We hope that you have an amazing week, and we hope that you enjoy watching the Masters Golf Tournament Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And next Monday, we are coming to you with an interview. If it doesn't get rescheduled with Daniel Vaughn, the chief barbecue connoisseur for Texas Monthly Magazine. So we hope that you stay tuned for that, and it should be a great episode. But Thomas Hattie, it's great as always. And uh, on behalf of my co-hosts, Hattie Horn, Thomas Bain, my name's Austin Staten. 
We'll see you next week. You've been listening to The Business Communicators. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a five-star review.